Welcome to this predicted paper from OnMaths. This paper represents the best guess for the upcoming exams. Please use this paper in addition to your other revision. You can complete a unique version of this paper by going to our OnMaths site. OnMaths is full of free content to help you prepare for your exams, such as topic-based papers, demon questions and mini-mocks. If you like what we do, please consider subscribing. To find a fraction of amount, what we do is we divide by the bottom of the fraction times by the top. So we're going to do 60 and we're going to divide it by the bottom of the fraction, the denominator, which is 3. And 60 divided by 3 is 20. Then we're going to do 20 times 1, which will just remain 20. So our answer is 20 kilograms. So a prime number is a number that is only in the 1 times table and its own times table. So 4, for example, is not a prime number because it is also in the 2 times table. 6 is in the 2 times table. 15 is in the 3 times table. 21 is also in the 3 times table. 9 is also in the 3 times table. Now 1 is a bit of a special case. The definition is that it has to be in 1 and its own times table. And technically 1 is only in one of those. So 1 is not a prime number. The smallest prime number is actually 2, but 2 is not in this list. 23, though, is not in any other times table, so 23 is a prime number. So if we do our place value grid, and so we've got uh, units here, tenths and hundredths. Don't think we need any more. So we can put in our number, is it 5? 0.87 and you can see here that the 8 here is in the tenths column so the 8 represents 8 tenths so I'm going to just copy that number down again just make it a bit bigger so we can see what we're doing okay we're asked to work that out round it to three significant figures that means three numbers from the left hand side so starting here one two, three. Now it's th the first number has to be um, not a zero. So if it was a decimal, we would start counting as soon as it wasn't a zero. After that four, then we're going to put a line down. Now all the numbers are going to turn into zero on the right hand side. So these numbers here will all turn to zeros. But before they do, we need to look at this number. Now this number is a decider number. If it is five or more, then it will push this number up by one. If it's less than 5, then nothing will happen. Because it's less than 5, all the numbers to the right will turn into zeros. And with decimals, if they're zeros, we don't need to write them. So the answer would be 30.4. Congruent means that it's a shape that is exactly the same as another shape, but it can be rotated, translated, can be flipped around. But it's basically the same shape. So I imagine cutting it out onto cardboard and trying to fit it into the other shape. If it can fit, then they are congruent. So looking at the shapes, we've got some triangles, we've got some um, weird looking shapes, but I'm gonna look at A, and I'm gonna draw A in. So I'm just gonna trace A. And what we can notice is if I manipulate that now, and if I bring it down to E, it kind of almost looks the same as E, but what I can do is actually just reflect it and it's exactly the same as E. So A and E are congruent. So I'm going to start just by copying this question. When we're told to solve, it means we need to find out what X is. And there's a nice little strategy to be able to do that. And the first thing we do is just draw lines left and right of the equal sign and we look at the left hand side and work out what is stopping x from being on its own well this minus 10 here is stopping x from being on its own so we need to get rid of that somehow and we do that by doing the opposite of it so what is the opposite of take away 10 well that's going to be plus 10 but you can't just do that to the left hand side you have to do the same thing to the right hand side so on the left hand side now we're left with just x because we've got rid of that takeaway 10. And on the right hand side we do 6 plus 10 which is 16. So our solution is x equals 16.
So a composite bar chart is where you'll stack the bar charts on top of each other. So we're going to start with this 12 here. And so I'm just going to do a bar up to 12. And these lines go up in twos, so it would be there. And then we're going to do this females. So we've done the males, we're going to do the females. And the females is only going to be one high, because they're going up in twos. And we need a way of showing male or female. So what I'm going to do is just shade the female there. And I'm going to just draw a key. I'm going to say if it's not shaded, it's males. And if it is shaded, it's females. Okay. Next, we're going to do the 8 and the 4. So what you can do is just do the whole thing and split it afterwards. So it would be like that. Shade in the females. And then finally we've got a 4 and a 12. shade in the females there. Now don't spend forever on your shading as long as it's clear which one male and which one's female. So football is represented as a quarter of this pie chart and so if there are 60 students all together we just do 60 divided by 4 to find a quarter of it and that's 15. So there are 15 people who picked football. In algebra, we don't show the time sign, so 17 times A times B just simply becomes 17 A, B. The midpoint of a line is just the halfway point of the line, and we can see that the halfway point will be here, and so the coordinates of that point are 0, 2. I'm going to start by working out what the building is, or the width of the building is, in centimetres. So it says 33 metres, and I'm going to convert that into centimetres by timesing by 100. Okay, now when it says it has a scale of 1 to 300, it means 300 in real life is 1 you know, on our map. So all I need to do is divide it by 300 to find out what it's going to be on our map. So we're going to just divide that by 300, and I get the answer of 11. So it's going to be 11 centimetres on our map. So we've got to first of all work out how many parts there are all together. So we're told that the ratio of red, yellow and green is 3 to 2 to 4. So to work out how many parts there are all, all together, we do 3 plus 2 plus 4, which is 9 parts. So there's 9 equal piles of sweets. Okay, But to work out what one part or one pile of sweets is worth, we're going to get the 99 sweets and divide it by the amount of piles, and that's going to be 11. So one part is worth 11 sweets. We're asked to find out how many yellow sweets, and yellow is the middle one, so it's going to be the two. So yellow has two piles of 11 sweets. Two times 11 is going to be 22, so it's going to be 22 sweets. So we can quickly draw a line of best fit for here, and it looks something like that. And if our line of best fit is increasing, like we have here, then we say the data is positive. If, however, the line of best fit is decreasing and looks like this, we say that it's a negative correlation. So positive if it's going up, which this one is. So it's a positive correlation. And if it's going down, then it's a negative correlation. If um, the data is all over the place, so it looks like something like this, where you've got the points everywhere, we say that's no correlation. To find the surface area of the cuboid, I'm just going to label the faces and do them individually. So we've got A, which is 24 by 13. So we're going to do 24 times 13 which is 312. Next we're going to do B, which is this one at the top, and it's 24 across, and 8 is the length, 
So 24 times 8, which is 192. And finally, C on this side here, which is going to be 13 times 8, which is 104. Now, notice that the faces all have the exact same face on the opposite side. So this one at the back is also A, this one at the side is also C, and the one at the bottom is also B. So what I'm going to do is add up all the areas of the squares and double it. So to work out the surface area, we're going to do 2 times, and then 312 plus 192 plus 104, and that will give me 1,216 centimetres cubed uh, squared, because it's an area. A plan is a view that you would get if you were on top of the shape, so you were in an airplane or something looking down on the shape. So the sides of this that we'll see, well we'd see this bit here, and we would see this bit here. So I'm going to start off with the first bit I shaded, and we've got to figure out what the different lengths will be. Well, this would be two centimeters across, and the whole thing is eight centimeters. The bit we don't want is three centimeters, so this part here will be five. It would look like it was five wide. So let's draw that on, and so we've got two centimeters down, and we've got five across. One, two, three, four, five. And that's this is what it would look like from above. Now the other part will be the same, same uh, two centimeters, but it will be three centimeters across. So we have three centimeters across. Now whenever you have a join or a change in elevation, you need to show that with a line across. And so this will be our completed answer. To work out the circumference, we need to first of all work out what the diameter of this is. And to do that, we just draw a line across the circle, and we can see the diameter is twice as big as the radius. So the diameter is going to be the radius times 2, which is 28. Formula for the circumference of a circle is just pi times the diameter, which will be pi times 28. Now to write this in terms of pi, which is the question asked for, we just put the number first and then pi, so it will be 28 pi. The formula y equals mx plus c includes this m, and the m means the gradient. So we're, if we're looking for something that is parallel to y equals 9x plus 18, we're looking at this number here. And for it to be parallel, it needs to have the same gradient. So we could just write y equals 9x plus or subtract anything. Or we could just write y equals 9x. I'm going to say plus 5. So when you read this question, the question is basically asking you to find the bearing of O from B. So the lifeboat is at B. So I'm going to draw a north line here. And to find a bearing, you start from the north line and you keep going um, clockwise. So we're going to look for this angle here. Now, this angle, which is given to us in the question, and this angle here, which I'm just going to call x, are going to be equal. So x is going to equal 135 degrees. And the reason for that is we've basically got, and I'm just going to draw a, or extend the north line down, because we've basically got a, a, well, we have a set of parallel lines here, and we have a set of, Z angles, which we know is alternate angles. So the reason for that is it's alternate angles. And always show the reasons to the examiner. Okay, and so to find out what the bearing is, so the bearing um, of O from B. It's just going to be 360 take away 135. And the reason for that is angles on a point we've run out of space. Okay, so we're going to do 360 take away 135, which is 200.
225. And so our answer is 225. So we know that um, 171 is 3 times 3 times 19. And what we do is we just compare 171 with 342. And we know that 171 times 2 is 342. So therefore 342 will have the same prime factors as 171, which is 3 times 3 times 19, but it will also have a times 2 in there. So the answer will be 2 times 3 times 3 times 19. Sometimes easier with these questions to multiply both numbers by, say, um, 10 or 100 or 1,000. Um, so if we look at the 0 0.06, if we times that by 100, it would make the question a lot easier. But with a division, if you times some, one of the numbers by 100, you have to times the other one by 100. So we just go times the 30 by 100 and times the 0 0.06 by 100 to make that 0 0.6. And this actually is the same calculation as 30 divided by 0 0.06. The reason being is that you can write that as a fraction. And you know with fractions you can just times to the top by something and times the bottom by something. It doesn't change the fraction at all. It just keeps it exactly the same. So we're going to use the bus stop method to find out what that is. So we're going to divide that out. 6 doesn't go into 3, so carry that. 6 is into 30, go 5, 6 into 0, 6 into 0, so that's going to be 500. There is quite an easy way of doing this question, but I'm going to show you the long way, and then we're going to work out what the quicker way is. So I'm going to pair up the A and the 1, which it suggests in the question. Then I'm going to work out the A and the 2 as a different combination, A3, A4 etc. Then I'm going to look at the B and do the same thing, B1, B2, B3, etc. Then I'm going to work out the C, so all the combinations with C. So how many, one, how many combinations are there with A? Well there's going to be seven because there's seven numbers. How many with B? Well there's also going to be seven. And how many with C? Well there's also going to be seven. So in total there's going to be 7 plus 7 plus 7, which is 21. And the way I can work that out easily is work out how many combinations there are with spinner 1. Well, there's 3. How many combinations there are with spinner 2? 7. And we just times the 2 together. 3 times 7 is 21. I'm going to write this out just a bit bigger so we can see what's going on. And there are loads of different methods for expanding brackets. I'm going to use smile and rainbows. So smile there, rainbow there, and I always put a little notch here to remind me to times it. So we're going to do 4 times 8, which is 32, and x times x, which is x squared. And we're going to do 4 times 3, which is 12, and x is just there. So when we expand that, we get 32x squared plus 12x. To find the smallest possible width, I'm just going to do a quick number line. And all I'm going to do is put 12... 0.2 on our number line and figure out what the next number down will be. Well, if it's the nearest tenth, the next number down would be 12.1. That's the next number down it could have rounded to. And I'm just going to cut this number line in half and find out where our halfway point is. Well, the halfway point would be 12.15, and that's actually the minimum it could have been before it would have rounded to 12.1. When translating, we translate with vectors, and the top number in a vector tells us how far right, and the bottom number tells us how far up we go. And to translate a shape, you always pick a point. Now I always pick the top leftmost point, so I'm going to pick this one. And looking at the vector, it says we're going to go two to the right. So we do two jumps to the right, one, two. Now looking at the bottom, because it's minus 4, instead of going up 4, we're going to go down 4. So it would be 1, 2, 3, 4. So our new coordinate for the top will be here. And the next thing we need to do is draw in the shape. So that's the top left part of the shape. And so I'm going to draw in the shape. And it's 4 across. So it should go here. And draw in the shape in there. Make sure 
that you know that that uh, coordinate is the top left part of our shape and it says to label it B. To find solutions for quadratics on a graph all you need to do is find out where the graph meets the x-axis. Okay, So the coordinates this graph meets the x-axis are here and here and that would be minus 0.8 and minus uh, and 0.2 and they're also called roots. To answer this question we need to know what an equation expression formula and identity is. So the formula is basically um, an equation but for real world things so area equals pi r squared it's where the letters actually mean something. Expression is um, just algebra without the equal sign so 5x plus 3 would be an expression. An equation um, has an equals and it can be solved so you can find out what x is or find out what a is and an identity is true for all values of that letter. So um, an, ex an example would be x times x equals x squared. That's an identity because that's true for all values of x. So looking here on the right hand side we've got 3x plus 2x but if we imagine x is 10, so 3x would be 30 plus 2x would be 20, 30 plus 20, well that will equal 5x, 5 times 10. And actually this is true for all values of x. And the reason it's true for all values of x is we know that 3x plus 2x, this right hand side here, equals 5x. They're the same thing. Now normally with an identity, it's shown with three lines. Now, in the exam, this type of question, it won't be shown with three lines because that kind of gives it away um, that it's an identity. But this um, question is definitely an identity. And you can't solve it because it's true for all values of x. So yes, x could be 10, x could be a million, x could be a third, x could be anything. So here we're given a standard form number and we're asked to make it an ordinary number, which is just a number you type into the calculator. So we're going to start off by writing the decimal, which is 6.2, and we're going to shift that decimal point somewhere that it will be the actual number rather than standard form anymore. First thing to point out is we look at the power. If it's positive, it means that our ordinary number is going to be a big number. If it's negative, it means it's going to be a very small number. Since this is positive, we know it's going to be a big number. So we're going to do four jumps, because there's a power of four, to the right to make it a big number. So one, two three, four. So the decimal point is going to be here. And we're going to fill in the jumps with zeros. So zero, zero, zero. So our new number is going to be 62 with three zeros, or 62,000. It's important to realize that we're actually shifting the numbers, not the decimal point, but it's a lot easier to move the decimal point in our working out. So the way this formula works is we have m, which is the final amount. Uh, the 2,000 here is our initial amount. The um, decimal in here is our multiplier. And the power here is the amount of years. So the way mul multipliers work is they are the percentage divided by 100. So if we go the other way and times it by 100 to make it back into a percentage, it will be 102.9%. Now it says what is the interest rate of the bank? Well the interest rate is always going to be 100% well this 102.9% is 100% plus the interest rate which will equal the 102.9% so the interest rate is going to be the 2.9% you always start off with 100% so if I put uh, a five pounds into my bank I've got 100% of that £5, and then the interest rate is on top of that 100%. So our answer here will be 2.9%. We're going to start by focusing on the A and B, which is 8 and 16. So in the middle, it's going to be 8 and 16. The next thing we're going to focus on is the fact that A is all the multiples of 4. Now, 8 and 16 have both already been taken because they're in the middle. So the remaining multiples of 4 are the 4 there and 
the 12 there. So the next ones I'm going to focus on is the A or B. So A or B is in A, in B, or in the middle. So if we cross out the ones we've already used, so we've already used the 8 and 16, and the 4 and the 12, that leaves the 1 and the 9. I'm going to cross that out of our other list. And there's only two left in our everything list at the top. We've got the 3 and we've got the 11. So on the outside we have 3 and we have 11. I'm going to do just a quick multiplication grid. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the 2x plus 3 at the top. So 2x and then plus 3 and then 3x minus 11 down the side. Multiply them out, 3 times 2 is 6, so that would be 6x squared. 3 times 3 is 9, so that would be 9x. Uh, minus 11 times positive 2 will be minus 22x. And then minus 11 times positive 3 will be minus 33. Get them all together, so we've got 6x squared plus 9x, because that is a positive. Minus 22x minus 33 and we can see the, here that the plus 9x and the minus 22x are like terms so we can add them together to make minus 13x and that's our answer so our answer is 6x squared minus 13x minus 33 you can complete a unique version of this paper by going to our on math site OnMaths is full of free content to help you prepare for your exams, such as topic-based papers, demon questions and mini-mocks. If you like what we do, please consider subscribing.